The Tom Woods Show, episode 709. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, one of the first things you figure out when you become a libertarian is that all the U.S. presidents your teachers told you were great were terrible. Learn the true history of the U.S. presidents and their crimes against liberty in our new course on the presidents. Check it out at freehistorycourse.com. If you're a homeschooling parent and you're tired of running yourself ragged, then check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And check it out through my special link where you get three free bonuses totaling $160. My special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm talking to Jim Ostrowski today. I have a little rant I want to go on after I talk to Jim, so don't turn it off when I'm done talking to Jim. Uh, anyway, uh, we're talking to Jim, who has been on the show before for his book on progressivism, about his brand new book written with his brother Michael called The Impeachment of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for High Crimes in Syria and Libya. Jim practices trial and appellate law in Buffalo, New York. He's an associated scholar of the Mises Institute, and he's been widely published and is always worth reading. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's always a pleasure. So you and your brother wrote this book together. I finished reading it actually this morning about five minutes before we, we spoke. I'm barely surviving in the middle of this uh, awful unpacking scenario. Right. What I was telling you before we went on is I like how relentlessly systematic – it's like a legal brief in a way, which I guess is not altogether foreign to you. Yeah. This, uh, this book is set up. I mean, it's extremely methodical, step by step, going through the origins – what was done to these places, and what the consequences were. So uh, you focus specifically on Syria and Libya. Let's start with Libya because I think it's less complicated. Yeah. So I guess it was back now in, boy, it's been a while, I guess 2011 right. when Obama decided to take action in Libya. And I, what I remember is being told that this was absolutely necessary because – uh, because uh, Gaddafi was on the verge of launching an attack that was going to wipe out, you know, an entire city or something. W what's the real story about what was going on there? Well, the facts are, you know, always unclear. And what we're really doing in the book, in spite of the title, is we're asking for an investigation because two two citizen, you know, journalist investigators can't ferret out everything. But it's, a, I think, it was a very common scenario where uh, there's a motivation to go to war unrelated to the reasons we're being told so the propaganda machine is primed up and uh, it was exaggerated the threat that Gaddafi uh, uh, presented because in fact he had already uh, taken over a couple of uh, uh, towns and cities and there hadn't been any atrocities and really so it was like one of these preemptive strikes where well, we think Gaddafi might do something, so we're going to um, attack first. So the ev the evidence was very unclear, um, and obviously there's a lot of issues involved, but no thought was given to what was going to happen after uh, he is taken out, and that's been true basically all along for really the entire history of, of our intervention in, in, in the Middle East. Gaddafi was a is a guy who's had a checkered past, of course, with the United States. Yes, and uh, but yet he was considered to be he was trotted out under George W. Bush as a great success story because this goes to show a lot of times we don't even need to wage war against every particular country. We can wage one war that makes us credible, and other countries will come do our bidding. And 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 it was said that look at Gaddafi, he's come forward and and relinquished. Uh, any uh, intention to go after weapons of mass destruction? This is a wonderful thing. So how do we go from this is a wonderful thing to he needs to be taken out? Well, that's complicated and not necessarily answered in, in the book. Um, uh, the book, obviously, we started uh, writing it in December. It's very narrowly focused. But we do get into um, the Arab Spring, and I think that Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions come to the fore because she didn't have a lot of accomplishments. And I think that basically she was looking for uh, a, foreign po a clear foreign policy victory that she could run on uh, 
in her obvious, you know, obvious presidential campaign that she was planning even back then and has probably been planning for decades. So I think what happened is the Arab Spring, which we point out in one of the chapters, we were on both sides of the Arab Spring, which is typical for our, our foreign policy. We supported the dictators for a number of reasons that are explained in the book. We also uh, backed, uh, you know, the, the, there's a whole like sort of uh, human rights uh, slash propaganda infrastructure where money goes from the State Department to various groups and those groups fund, you know, agitators in various countries. And so the U.S. was really part of the Arab Spring and this appeared to be a way to bring the Arab Spring to uh, Libya with the, uh, with the United States uh, playing a lead role and then uh, a, a political victory. I mean, it really does, it, it doesn't make much logical sense, but certainly I think the clearest explanation is um, Obama's interest in the Arab Spring, his, uh, uh, his attempt to build on the legacy of, of his youth where he had obviously um, uh, Muslim connections in his, in his background. Uh, he wanted to you know, be the savior who was going to bring all these people together. And then Hillary's political ambitions to, to run for president, and it all adds up to this, uh, this disastrous and, and really illegal invasion of Libya, and Libya has never recovered to, to this day. What did the intervention actually consist of? What did the U.S. do? Well, uh, again, we're not even totally clear on that. They may have had people on the ground instigating this thing initially, but it was it was mainly uh, air power uh, taking out uh, Gaddafi's uh, forces, and ultimately, um, when he was really on the run and really no longer a, an offensive threat, uh, they really took him out. Um, the air power took, uh, disabled his convoy, ends up, you know, on the side of some road somewhere, and really was brutally murdered by uh, our alleged uh, allies, uh, really an, uh, just a brutal assassination. So uh, mainly air power, uh, but there were also CIA operatives on the ground. Uh, they were supposed to be a weapons embargo, and we, we have a, a, a site in the book where they sort of looked the other way when, when weapons went to the, uh, the rebels. And one of the points is that the, the UN resolution, which we deny gave legal authority uh, for this for reasons explained uh, in the book, uh, w was supposed to protect all civilians. But basically what happened is that our, our, uh, our air forces and whatever forces, covert forces were on the ground, basically simply backed the rebels allowed them to gain the advantage in the civil war and then they committed various atrocities against civilians uh, who had been supporting the regime so really the whole thing was uh, was a cluster dance uh, uh, the they went way beyond even if you concede that even if you assume for the sake of argument that the UN resolution did allow uh, the United States to go to war without a declaration of, of Congress they went way behind it way beyond it excuse me as uh, even as the New York Times pointed out, it it sort of um, quickly evolved into uh, regime change, and uh, that was never authorized by the uh, UN resolution. All right, so they go ahead and do this. Uh, Hillary cackles about it, literally cackles about it. Yes. And then, what are the actual consequences? I mean, of course, it seems like anybody at all—you don't have to have a PhD in anything. Anybody at all knows this does not end with uh, Western-style Democrats no, never. Uh, implementing the U.S. Constitution. Everybody knows that. Never. It's, uh, it, that, that's the neighborhood in that part of the world. It's not New England uh, you know, town hall meeting democracy. So it's going to, be, it's going to get very uh, primitive in the sense that it's going to go back to religious ideologies, ethnic rivalries. Um, there was sort of a, a concern of, of genocide against uh, darker-skinned people in Libya that many people have pointed out, and that uh, those forces were were unleashed uh, uh, against them. So basically, you know, there's a, there's jihadists in there. There's always, of course, your alleged sort of middle-class moderate forces, but they don't seem to have a lot of support over there. So what we have now is 
It's just been uh, chaos, sort of a lower medium grade civil war. There's competing governments. At one point, the parliament of one of the competing governments you know, met offshore. And um, it's, it's just a gigantic mess. Obviously, ISIS uh, went down there and um, in the chaos and started uh, creating a power base for itself. And there was the brutal murder on the on the seacoast uh, that we that we heard about uh, the uh, the killing of the Christians. I don't, I don't know if they were Coptic Christians, but they were Christians and um, they were beheaded on the seashore. We all heard about that a couple years ago. So uh, it, it's it's a complete uh, it's a complete disaster. One of the points we try to make in the book is it's uh, obviously the odds of these people being impeached are, are very small, but we also want to impeach their ideology, which you know, following up in my prior book is is progressivism. And there's some actual quotes from Obama and Hillary that are that are cited in the book. For example, Obama says, "Yeah, we didn't go in with enough force." Well, isn't that part of the whole ideology of progressivism? And and you, when you apply that to domestic policy, they they always say, "Well, we didn't spend enough money." But, you know, uh, the same uh, principle applies, except in foreign policy, you're using force. And then Hillary had a couple of great, um, uh, great lines here where she says, you know, she, she, she wants to be caught trying, caught trying, and she has a deep belief in American power to do good. So what, what the larger point of the book is that uh, we need to examine this ideology of progressivism because I believe that it has influenced our foreign policy over the years. This notion that there's always like a governmental solution to a problem. Obviously Libya was not a utopia and could be improved, but the question is can can the American government power in 2011 intervene and make that a better place? The progressive for no because progressivism is not rational, it's, it's, it's something else, it's, it's emotional or whatever it is. Uh, the progressive believes this, this, has this irrational belief, and unfortunately they act on their beliefs, and we have the disaster in Libya and, and, and later on in Syria. And incidentally, you mentioned uh, the need to study progressivism as if anticipating the need for a convenient source on progressivism. You also wrote a book on that, which we talked about on the show. Yeah. So I'm going to link to your book and that episode, that earlier episode, on the page for this episode, which will be tomwoods.com slash 709. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate that. In, in all honesty, uh, when you tackle a new project, it, it gives you a chance to you know, take some of the prior uh, work that, you know, I've done and, and other people have done. And I kind of had a, a just a sudden realization that progressivism obviously applies to foreign policy. And I talked about that in, in the book a year and a half ago. But it just it occurred to me that it, it's, it's really worse than foreign policy, because at least in domestic policy, they have various tools like you know wasting our tax money on, on 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 programs but in foreign policy what 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 can the progressive do the progressive basically reverts to brute force which of course is there in domestic policy in sort of a very hidden way uh, but progressivism in foreign policy i concluded is actually worse because its tool is basically war or covert intervention you know low grade war so um, I hope I've been slightly advanced uh, the work I did in the prior uh, book. And that book is called Progressivism, A Primer on the Idea Destroying America. Yes. Let's switch gears and say something about Syria. I think for a lot of people, Syria is kind of like Bosnia in the mid-90s. It seems so complicated yeah. that, you know, the libertarian might think, well, look, I know the U.S. shouldn't be involved. That's all I know. I, I can't make any sense out of any of this. Can you make sense out of it for us? Yeah, and that's what I actually thought. Um, I remember being bothered by Syria more than Libya. Maybe I was on trial or something when Libya was happening, but I just thought, wow, Syria, that's, that's not a country that we've had much um, involvement with. And why are we involved? And I remember uh, I just lo located a, a quick blog post I did on com calling for Obama to be impeached. It was like back in uh, 2000, um, 2013. But I think Syria um, is, first of all, you have to understand that Syria is a, is a multi-ethnic state. It's kind of like Iraq, 
but the opposite. So there, the Sunni, there's more Sunnis than Shiites, and the Shiites there are often called Alawites, and I'm not an expert on religion or theology, but it's, it's kind of a branch of, of, of the Shiite uh, branch of Islam. So it, there's, a, there's a five or six or hundred year, maybe even older uh, battle between these groups over there. Syria is a, it's a, it's a very rough neighborhood if you look on the map, and it has been for really all of recorded history. So somehow the, the, uh, the Alawites uh, uh, got control of Syria, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. And they're not. They were not. They're not going to let the the Sunnis back in power because they remember, like, say, 300 years ago, there was a slaughter. So this is what we're looking at here. So when you when you go in there and intervene for whatever bogus excuses they had, which which we can discuss, you have to understand that the the she, the, the Alawites are going to fight to the absolute death because they know that you know they think. Let's let's just say they think that they're going to be actually physically wiped out. So uh, th this whole notion that there's been a long and brutal civil war in there, well, of course there has. Everybody should have known that. Uh, everybody should have known that going in. So the question in Syria was: the facts are a little murkier there because Clinton says, "Well, you know, I I told uh, I urged Obama to go in there in full force, and he didn't do it." But the fact of this is that we were there in a in a covert way. Uh, there's more and more evidence coming out, and WikiLeaks is threatening to uh, release more emails to indicate that even back in, in the uh, Benghazi days, that the whole Benghazi operation was about gun running to Syria. Now, we, we can't certify that as true. We, we cite the sources, and we believe that more evidence will, will come out. So, there, you know, why, why, was the Amer why were the Americans so interested in, in Syria? Well, it, it, I, as we talk about in the book, there's like this global, you know, chess game involving Iran. At various times in history, we, we look at the Sunni forces as the, uh, as the enemy. Uh, these days, we're sort of working with the Sunni forces, which is uh, in countries uh, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, which is, of course, very bizarre given their... Uh, alleged ties to terrorism, given how how poorly they they treat women, and we have the first woman candidate for president. But these days, uh, you know, the big enemy is Iran, um, and I think that Syria's main importance is it's it's considered to be part of the Iranian Shiite uh, empire. So let's take let's take out um, Assad over there, and there's been various attempts to do it. I think they wanted to go in with great force after the sarin gas attack, and then it was kind of unclear who actually did the attack. Some people think it was Erdogan in Turkey, the fellow who just, uh, you know, quote, survived the coup, which some people is very suspicious of what, that, what happened with that coup. But um, it, it, it's, it's, it, is, uh, it is quite confusing, but I think it's ultimately about a larger chess game involving Iran, um, where the uh, pro-Israel faction of American foreign policy uh, uh, believes that Iran is the great th threat to Israel. And I think that was a factor. And there's an email from Jamie, Jamie Rubin that Hillary uh, seemed to have passed on in approval, indicating that taking, on, taking out Assad would, would ultimately help Israel. All right. So, where does Syria stand now? Uh, is uh, in terms of uh, like how can we describe the consequence of American involvement if we can disentangle how American involvement has affected the situation? Well, it's funny because early on, before we even thought about writing the book, I remember just casually uh, hearing that, um, or getting the impression from the mainstream media, which, by the way, I, I call them Pravda now. It's it's, it's just. It's just gotten so bad. But I always had the impression that this, the Syrian rebels were just on the edge of the capital and about to hang uh, Assad by the lamppost. But in fact, uh, Assad had a tremendous amount of support and, and an obviously, you know, organized central government. And uh, the, the, uh, the rebels were, were never able to uh, defeat him. And, but uh, egged on, I think, by, you know, uh, American uh, intervention and sort of covert aid, and some of the aid was not covert. And I, I contend really that 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 
that's sort of you know, almost an act of war in itself when you provide support to a side in the Civil War. But um, they were, uh, the Civil War has dragged on. It has generated hundreds of thousands of, of refugees leaving uh, Syria, going into Europe. Maybe ISIS has smuggled in uh, terrorists in that group. No, nobody really knows. It's caused chaos in Europe. It's become an issue in the presidential uh, campaign um, currently. So, like Syria, basically, there's been a lot of murder, mayhem, a chaos, and the, the big problem with Syria is that uh, the Russians came in because the Russians are, are longtime uh, allies of, of Syria. So, at one point, the U.S. had two factions. The, uh, the, the CIA was, was arming one rebel faction, and the Pentagon was arming uh, allegedly uh, another moderate faction, which turned out to consist of uh, you know, like, like maybe 12 people. And these two sides were fighting each other. Turkey shot down a, a, a Russian uh, 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 military plane right on the border, and who knows what the actual facts are there. So what our concern in the book, and really if you look at the cover of the book, uh, there's a, a photo which is actually uh, uh, probably a cruise missile or something like that, in Libya, but it looks like a nuclear mushroom cloud, and that's quite deliberate because for no particular important reason affecting the United States, um, Obama and Clinton have us involved in a scenario where for the first time in really a really long time, maybe even Vietnam, um, we have American forces or forces allied or supplied by Americans on the same battlefield with Russia, which is the uh, which is obviously a, a serious uh, superpower, and obviously Russia and the United States and, or China, they're not going to deliberately start a nuclear war. These things happen like you see in the movies. They, there's mistakes and misunderstandings and things escalate. If, if Russia had escalated, you know, we're, we're told that Putin is such a madman, uh, he used incredible restraint against Turkey after their uh, military plane was shot down, but what if he hadn't? What if he had gotten off on the gotten up on the wrong side of the bed that day? Now we have a, a, a an alliance with Turkey. Are we going to fight Russia over that? So this thing is. Uh, and I just saw an ad today about uh, Trump and the nuclear codes and everything. Uh, and and it, it's not a partisan book. I haven't endorsed anybody uh, for president, uh, but who's really the nuclear? Uh, uh, threat here. Uh, we, we have one, one candidate is, is, is supported involvement in a war which at least creates a serious threat of a nuclear confrontation with Russia. How does ISIS fit into the story you're telling in the book? Again, Tom, very, very complicated, very murky. So basically, as I see it, the uh, U.S. goes into Iraq, and uh, I, I wrote about this at the time, and other, uh, others did, that, look, Iraq's an artificial country. So, long story short, they have elections. The Shiites are the majority there, about 60%. And guess what? The Shiites control the government. And guess what? In that part of the world, um, that's a life and death matter. And the, and the, the Sunnis... Uh, perceive whether true or not, probably true, but it doesn't matter. But they perceive that they're going to be victimized, and they start various uh, low-grade sort of rebellions against the Shiites. And this goes on for for a number of years, and ultimately, uh, a guy named Zarqawi um, uh, he kind of takes the you know market competition in the direction of whoever's the most vicious is going to get the most attention and really take power. He was a pretty nasty guy, and he he created a a force there that ultimately turned into ISIS. He was killed uh, before ISIS. So there is so basically ISIS is uh, what happens when. Uh, the Sunni area of Iraq has no government that, it, that any of them consider to be legitimate or acting in their favor. It's a tough neighborhood. There's no, uh, uh, the way to express your opposition is through, is through force over there. So ISIS sort of grows out of this power vacuum where there is no Sunni government that, that the Sunnis recognize. And, but ISIS gets its big chance when, um, uh, uh, the Libyan, when, when Gaddafi is, cop, is, is toppled, and there's this very large uh, country in the general neighborhood uh, in the Middle East available to go in there and occupy and set up camp. And uh, 
the Syrian war also creates an opportunity for ISIS to go into the Sunni areas of Syria, which are significant, as I already said, Syria has a very large Sunni population. So uh, ISIS was not created by uh, Obama or Hillary. However, it was a relatively uh, small force before Libya and Syria. Lib Libya Syria gave ISIS the opportunity to grow uh, and, and really thrive as they have and really become a threat to Europe. Uh, obviously, there's been terrorist attacks in the United States. So this has become a worldwide uh, mess. Now, why did you write this book the way you did and in, in not writing it as a book about, hey, here's some bad policy decisions that led to some terrible consequences? Why is it framed in terms of impeachment? There's no chance either. Well, certainly can't impeach Clinton now. No chance of impeachment. So why are you framing it this way? Um, I believe the framers took impeachment very seriously. And I think it's the lack of impeachment over the years for some of the uh, things that presidents have done in foreign affairs, or at least the threat of impeachment, that has basically allowed Obama and, and Hillary when she was Secretary of State to just have this sort of casual attitude about, oh, you know, oh well, War Powers Act doesn't apply. Uh, there's no declaration of war, but, um, you know, all the other presidents have done it, so I'm going to do it. I know you guys aren't going to impeach me. So although we're, 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 not, we're not naive about the prospects for an actual impeachment of either Obama, times clicking on that, or Hillary if she does get in there, we do believe that if we're going to stop these foreign misadventures, which has plagued us for over 100, about 100 years now, uh, there should be a serious talk about impeachment. Now, uh, point two, uh, we do intend, the book just came out, I just got copies myself the other day, and I'm, I'm going to be dropping off copies to the local uh, Congress people around here, and we're going to start to do that slowly. Um, every Congress, uh, every member of Congress is going, of the House, because uh, they're the ones who, who do the initial impeachment, uh, they're all going to get a copy. So, um, we can hold them accountable. If they don't care about the, 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 the obligation they have to impeach, um, then we can hold them accountable. But we also, uh, we also believe, you know, there is, it is a policy wonk book in the sense that we do talk about the, 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 the ideological attitudes like progressivism uh, that lead to bad policies such as this. We, there's a phrase in the book, we want to impeach you know, progressivism, which is probably more the point of the book. But uh, impeachment is, has, has been like a, you know, just a scarecrow, and it should be a serious threat And if we want these constant foreign wars to stop. Of course, one of the people you're talking about in the book and in your very title is running for president this year. So this is not entirely removed from immediate events. I mean, it's certainly still current events, but it's, it is relevant to what's going on right before our eyes here. Now, at the same time, she's running against Donald Trump, who says it was a big mistake to go into Libya and it was a big mistake to go into Iraq. But a number of people have pointed out to me that at the time, he was demanding more action on Libya, you know, before, before it actually happened. Uh, and he uh, did favor the Iraq war. So it's hard even to know where he stands on this. But how do you situate your book in terms of the election? Well, I'm hoping that, uh, given the unlikelihood of actual impeachment, I am hoping to have uh, an impact on, on some of the voters who read the book. Um, I, we, we do want to get the book out to some of the candidates, uh, you know, the minor party candidates. Obviously, uh, we hope that Donald Trump reads the book. Um, the funny thing is that after we came up with the idea for the book, which was in December, we, we noticed that uh, Trump, uh, I know he's not tapping our phones or anything, but I just noticed that Trump started to talk about Syria and Libya. So even though his early comments on these subjects were uh, somewhat casual and somewhat contradictory, he does deserve credit, I think, uh, you know, from libertarians for criticizing these policies. And I, I'm not uh, thrilled with, you know, his solutions, and I'm not sure that his, you know, that, that he has sort of a, 
a, a deep understanding of the problems here. But uh, we, bottom line is that these issues, the, the campaign has gotten so off course, we're talking about, you know, gold star, you know, parents and so on. There's real issues here that both Hillary has to answer for and Trump has to explain how he's going to do better. Not just that, oh, I don't agree with Syria, Libya. What are you going to do better? Um, he's talking about going after ISIS, but without an understanding that unless there's a Sunni-friendly government in that area, there's going to be turmoil for the next 500 years. So I'm hoping that uh, the voters uh, read the book. I'm hoping the media discusses the book. I hope the candidates read the book and, and maybe uh, open their minds a little bit to some of the ideas in it. All right, so how can people get a copy, I assume, through Amazon? Yeah, uh, Amazon's great. It's uh, Kindle and paper at this point. It's uh, priced to sell. It's, it's, uh, like, it's a short, readable uh, book, but it's, it, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's kind of packed with, with good stuff, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I sometimes talk about how much I can't stand books that are just fluff. And I, I sit there, I read 300 pages, and I've learned four things. A shame <laughs> on me for going through the whole thing at that point. But but yours is shorter, but, but there is no fluff. And every single sentence packs a punch. So the book is The Impeachment of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton for High Crimes in Syria and Libya. Linking to it, of course, at TomWoods.com slash 709. Good luck with it, Jim. Thanks for doing it. Tom, uh, thanks a heck of a lot. All right, before we wrap up for today, let me do a little bit of, uh, let's do a little chit-chat about something. I sent this out to my email list uh, this morning. If you're not on my list, you should get on my list. All the cool people read my emails. Uh, all you have to do is go to BernieIsWrong.com, and uh, you can get my free ebook on Bernie Sanders. You say, ah, Bernie Sanders is old news, but his arguments sure aren't, and you're going to need to be able to defend yourself against them. So you get that free ebook, and it puts you on my list. Also, the red notify me button at tomwoods.com has the same effect, it puts you on my email list and sends you that free book. Well, anyway, uh, I was writing this morning because I was very frustrated to hear about what happened to poor Brian McClanahan, who's been on the show, and he's a faculty member over at my libertyclassroom.com. And apparently he had some kind of a promotion or an ad or something where AOL, of all places, boosted his recent book, Nine Presidents Who Screwed Up America and Four Who Tried to Save Her. And now I didn't know that many people were still using AOL, and neither did Brian. But the problem was this meant that this blast about his book went out to a lot of people who have never had a thought outside the conventional way of thinking about the presidents. You know, I, I just accept that the ones my teacher told me are the good ones must be the good ones. So Brian got this barrage of one-star reviews by people who obviously hadn't read his book. And this has happened to me before, too. They obviously haven't read it. They're saying the opposite of what's in the book. So they're upset that the, the two Bushes aren't being included among the presidents who screwed up America. But they are. All you have to do is read the book. It's in there. Uh, I think it's pages 161 to 168 and 173 to 179, something like that. I mean, they're, they're right in there. So these people just made that up. They didn't bother to read it, obviously. So they went ahead and bashed it and said, boy, this book isn't worth anything. But you haven't even touched the book physically. You haven't read a word in it. Seems kind of not fair to do that, even to somebody you disagree with. You know, just sort of basic manners 101. And I've gotten a position where I, I mean, I, I would never do that. Um, there were times when I was a youngster that I would criticize a book I hadn't read because I thought, well, I pretty much know what it's going to say, so I think I can criticize it. I don't do that anymore. After you become an author, it's kind of like when you, you know, you work in a restaurant and you, you watch, uh, well, I still say waiter and waiters and waitresses. I'm, I'm not, I haven't changed on that. When you watch them running around, and it's a very difficult job, I think, you're more likely to tip better if you, you or somebody you know worked in that job. Well, likewise, as an author, you just can't bear to see this happen to, to really anybody. And even when I was in that big argument with Mark Levin, which you can get the gist of at tomwoods.com slash Levin, and he had a new book out, and people were going over there. Libertarians are going over there and giving him one-star reviews, and they hadn't read it. I, for what it was worth, came out and said, please don't do that. That is beneath you. We don't do that. And on the air, he actually thanked me for, for that. So 
that's where I stand. You just can't do that to an author. You owe it to the person to at least read what he has to say. Plus, you, you wind up making a fool out of yourself. I mean, <laughs> these people are posting reviews that clearly, that absolutely 100% reveal they haven't read the book. They're demanding to know why two people aren't in it who clearly are in it. And then there's a professor. He says, I'm a professor myself, and no reputable historian says that FDR and Teddy Roosevelt and these other people were among the worst presidents. But what possible difference could that make? Historians can tell us what presidents did, but why would I also want to be lectured to by them about which ones I'm supposed to like? Wouldn't that depend on whether I like what they did? How could there be some objective historical standing of the best presidents? All they can do is tell us, unless they're going to smuggle in ethical judgments, which is not what I'm looking to these people for. Of all people in the world, U.S. historians are you know, pr pretty much down at the bottom of the barrel in terms of people I would look to to, to render an ethical judgment. So, no, to the contrary, I have different values from most historians. Dissenting historians, like you know, dissident historians like Brian and me, we have different values. So, of course, we're going to rank them differently. But secondly, we also have a theoretical understanding of cause and effect. I understand that it's not enough to say that this president passed the Help Everyone with Free Education Act and say, well, that must be good because I like free education, or Let's Make Everybody Rich Act. Well, that must have good consequences because making everybody rich sure sounds like an awesome thing. We have a little bit more sophisticated understanding of what the real consequences of these types of legislation are. So our assessments are going to be a little bit different from people who just list a series of laws that were passed and say, boy, isn't that awesome? So anyway, for what it's worth, I tracked down, Brian said on his podcast that somebody on Twitter had done the same thing. I tracked this guy down and smashed him and said, you haven't read the book. Here are the page numbers where the bushes can be found. So shut your mouth. So there you go. Okay, that's one thing that can get me kind of grumpy. Also having a cold for several days gets me a little bit grumpy. But man, that is just such not, not a good thing. to Don't do that. Don't do that. I hope, I hope my folks are uh, a cut above people who would lower themselves to quite that level. All right, that's going to do it. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Join us on the Contra Cruise. You want to go on vacation with a guy like me after I just went on that rant? How about a week of that? <laughs> Imagine what it would be like after a drink. No, no, no. We're going to have a lot of fun on our uh, wonderful cruise coming up this October. Get the details uh, on it at ContraCruise.com, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.